their father, Isaac, he brings his sons to him and he says, I am giving you the most important thing that a parent can give a child, which is a good name. And that kind of fixation on the name and what it means, what it stands for, is a, a thing that I think kind of runs through this story from those early days. Corporate fraud works best in the shadows, behind corporate walls. How does the government bring these wrongdoers to justice? Whistleblowers. These are the stories of those who risk their careers to shine a light on allegations of fraud. Today on Fraud in America. Well, welcome to this special episode of Fraud in America. We have a very special guest with us today, Patrick Radden Keefe. He's a staff writer at The New Yorker. He's uh, the author of a New York Times bestselling book called Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction and was selected as one of the 10 best books of 2019 uh, by the New York Times Book Review, the uh, Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the Entertainment Weekly named it one of the top 10 best nonfiction books of the decade. Uh, He's also the uh, creator and host of an eight-part podcast called Wind of Change. But today, uh, we're going to focus on his latest book called Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. Uh, It is a uh, sweeping investigative chronicle of three generations of the Sackler family, uh, which made their fortune on Valium and then uh, had their reputation torn down by its promotions of Oxycontin. Patrick, welcome to today's show. It's great to be with you. Thank you. So, Patrick, interestingly, uh, and you highlight this in your book, this is a story that really didn't involve whistleblowers. The whistleblowers seem to be absent uh, when it came to Purdue Pharma. Why do you think that was the case? Oh, it's a great question. And it's one that I I thought really hard about as I was uh, working on the book, is that you have this, this corporation, Purdue Pharma, in which there's a lot of bad stuff going on really over the course of decades huge amount of civil litigation, a lot of bad press going back 20 years, but you also get a a federal guilty plea, criminal charges um, in 2007, and then another one in 2020. And so you look at that and you wonder uh, how were there not insiders who would blow the whistle? And I think there's a variety of explanations. I mean, I, I think one of them is that it was very much an aspect of the culture of this company that if anyone, you know, whether inside or outside the company started raising issues, they would just come at them like a ton of bricks. Um, and so when journalists did it, they went after the journalists. There was an instance early on in which there was a woman who was kind of a whistleblower, a woman who had been a sales rep who was fired. She pursued a lawsuit against the company in Florida, not looking for any huge payout, really. She was looking for, you know, kind of a six figure sum, essentially, to um, to justify what she perceived as her wrongful termination. Um, And they just buried her. I mean, they really uh, went after her with a fleet of really powerful lawyers um, and killed the case. And so I think some of it was a was a perception that they would come after you. But I also think that it's a story in some ways about groupthink. And this is a privately held company. And there was a kind of a thesis that they had with the introduction of OxyContin. And in some ways, psychologically, the most interesting aspect of this story for me is what happens when your thesis turns out to be wrong? What happens when you send it out there in the world and you start getting these contrary indications? And in this case, it was, you know, the news that your drug is addicting people and in fact, killing people. Yeah. How do you assimilate that new information? And I think there was a tendency to just kind of double down and double down and, and develop a little bit of a bunker mentality. And I found that that was true of, of successive generations of employees at Purdue. Mm. So what, what originally drew you to this story? You know, it's a funny one. I had written um, a lot about the drug trade, but the illegal drug trade. And I had done a couple of big pieces about the Sinaloa drug cartel. I was really interested in... Uh, the ways in which the illicit drug economy works. And I I was particularly interested in the way in which drug traffickers operate like business people. Before I went full-time at The New Yorker, I did a big cover story for The New York Times Magazine in 2012 about the Sinaloa cartel. And the idea was it was kind of a Harvard Business School case study of a drug cartel. And um, 
I, at a certain point, uh, realized that they were sending a lot more heroin across the border than they had in the past. Hmm. And that was a bit of a riddle. And, and the answer turns out to be the opioid crisis, that you wow. had this generation of Americans who their on-ramp to opioids was prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they kind of graduate to heroin. And once I got into that, it didn't take long to get to OxyContin and Purdue Pharma. And then what really knocked me out was learning that this company was owned by the Sackler family, who certainly when I started looking into this in 2017, this was a family with a pretty unimpeachable yeah. reputation in kind of high society circles uh, in places like New York. Mm. A few days ago, in this case, uh, this has kind of been wrapped up at some level from a, a bankruptcy, a, just a level of um, feeling like they got away with it is, is how I'm feeling right now. I, I wonder what your take was from uh, the recent news coming out of this bankruptcy court proceeding. Yeah. I mean, I think, listen, the I, I should say, uh, <laughs> lest there be any doubt um, for, for those who are joining us, that the Sacklers did not cooperate with this book. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a big kind of multi-generational biography of this family, but, but they weren't talking to me um, and actually went to some lengths to try and frustrate my, um, you know, my publication of the book. In fairness to them, I think they would probably tell you, you know, get away with it. You know, first of all, we didn't do anything wrong. And second of all, we're, we're paying this big settlement in order to essentially insulate ourselves from any future liability or litigation uh, surrounding these events. So they're going to pay something like $4.3 billion. Um, having said that, I, I would argue that you're absolutely right, that they they are getting away with it. I think depending on how you look at that $4.3 billion figure, it's paid out over nine years. Um, they're going to end up richer when they're done paying it than they are today. I think for me, part of what I was trying to do with the book, um, because all of this was sort of unfolding in real time as I was writing, Right. Was was not only tell the story of uh, what, what I perceive to be a kind of a set of pretty atrocious bad actors, but also tell a story about the kind of insulating system uh, of fixers and lawyers and consultants and, um, you know, the lobbyists and the way in which money can can insulate that kind of bad actor from any significant downstream consequences for their own their own actions mm, right uh so let's let's dive into it uh so you know this story starts out many many years ago you go through three generations uh starting off i guess really with isaac and it became kind of american dream come true right can you talk a, a little bit about that you know the how they got started three generations ago yeah absolutely i mean i you know i'm, I'm glad you pick up on that because for me they're uh, particularly in the first third of the book. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of romance there, yeah. right? Like this is this sort of iconic American story. It's a, it's a Horatio Alger narrative, right? You, you have uh, a couple of immigrants, uh, Isaac and Sophie Sackler, who come from Europe uh, at the turn of the last century. They end up in Brooklyn. Isaac goes into business. He's got a grocery store. He, you know, has a little real estate concern. He's got, you know, some apartments that he rents out and he, um, they have three kids. Uh, Arthur, Mortimer, and Raymond. And these three brothers grow up in Flatbush in Brooklyn. They're Jewish. They experience a lot of anti-Semitism growing up. They grow up against the backdrop of the Great Depression. So their father actually loses everything. But they have this kind of faith in the American meritocracy, this sense that, you know, I should say as, as, as young white men, yeah. um, that as long as they can get uh, a good education, that there's really nothing limiting what they'll be able to do in the span of a single lifetime. So they set out to, as you say, to kind of make a name for themselves. There's this, this moment where their father, Isaac, when he loses everything during the depression, he brings his sons to him and he says, listen, I'm not gonna be able to give you any money, but I am giving you the most important thing that a parent can give a child, which is a good name. Mm. And that kind of fixation on the name and what it means, what it stands for, is a, a thing that I think kind of runs through this story from those early days. So I was very interested in that kind of arc of like, yeah. what does the meaning mean? Yeah, that through line was very strong. Yeah, the, the I forget the line or even who it, who said it might have been uh, Richard you know, talking about his father saying, you know, fortunes can be, you can re 
gain a fortune, right? You can lose a fortune, but you can get it back. But your name is something that. Uh, yeah, it was Isaac. It was you Isaac. Know, was oh, some, yeah. You know, so you lose a fortune, you go out and make another fortune. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you lose your good name, it's gone for good. I love the story of the three brothers. Uh, even in high school, uh, Arthur was uh, involved in a bunch of different things. Uh, that seems to carry him on through the rest of his life, right? This idea of an entrepreneurial spirit, even in high school for Arthur. Yeah, I love that about Arthur. Uh, you know, it's it's this kind of, I mean, Arthur is just a character that, yeah, as a nonfiction writer, you know, this stuff is all found art. There's a kind of richness to him as a personality. I obviously take issue with a lot of what he did in his life, but he has a certain charisma. And I think part of that charisma is he just had this sense of hustle. He was a hustler. And throughout his life, there was this kind of relentlessness. And so he, you know, whether he's doing uh, psychiatric research at this asylum in, in Queens, or when he gets into the world of medical advertising and marketing, he, he kind of revolutionizes everything he touches. Mm. Yeah, there's a great line in the book you talk about how he invented the wheel when it came to actually promoting directly to doctors. A lot of the what later become kind of a, they spun off and, and started doing other things really seem to start with Arthur's vision of how to actually reach out and, and I guess in his view, educate doctors about the needs for some of these meds. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of these things where Arthur told a very sophisticated kind of sly story about what he did for a living. And I think it's it's ultimately, um, you know, kind of self-serving BS. Right. But boy, it, it kind of goes over well. So what he said was, so this is following uh, the development of um, penicillin and, you know, in the 19... 19- 40s, 1950s, kind of post-war years, you get all these pharma companies producing new drugs and doctors don't know about them. And so he has to kind of come in and be the bottleneck. Um, and it's and, and he sort of talked about it in terms of education because he thought doctors are they're unimpeachable. All they're thinking about is the interest of the patient. No doctor could be hijacked by an advertising campaign but, but realistically, you know, Arthur Sackler starts an advertising firm and the whole thing is premised on the idea that you're going to influence doctors and you're going to get paid to do it. So I, I, you know, one of the kind of themes that I'm very interested in is the stories that people tell themselves about what they're doing when they're doing stuff that may not be all that great for society. And, um, and in Arthur's mind, you know, he wasn't even a medical advertising guy, even though he owned a medical advertising agency. He was really in the business of kind of continuing medical education on the virtues of pharmaceuticals. All, all behind the scenes, uh, not not divulging his yeah. conflicts, right? right. It's, it's very interesting. I, I had a flow chart and I, I unfortunately didn't bring it uh, to my office when, the, when we're talking right now, I'm trying to map out all the different businesses that he was involved in. And, and you talk about some of these, an ad agency, he also had a medical journal. And, and of course, then there was the pharmaceutical company uh, that he ultimately ended up purchasing and, and kind of rolling out uh, from there. Um, the two brothers, at least in your book, come across as kind of tag alongs. Is that what you found in your research that they really were playing second fiddle to Arthur, at least in those early years? I think certainly during his lifetime, yeah, and, and during those early years. I mean, for a long time, you have these three brothers. There's no daylight between them. They're very, very, very tight. And Arthur is this kind of parent figure for his younger brothers. And so starting in high school, he's help hooking them up with jobs. You know, he helps pay their way through medical school. When they start getting into philanthropy, he's, I found these, you know, I've got the, I sort of have the receipts on this because I went and, and did all this digging and it's, uh, you know, Arthur in the, in the fifties is writing to Columbia university and saying, my brother Raymond is going to write you a check for this. My brother Mortimer is going to write you a check for this. And then he turns to them and says, now you will write a check <laughs> you know, and pursue this stuff. He buys Purdue Frederick, this pharmaceutical firm, and installs them uh, to kind of run the run the company. So yeah, he's he's very much the guy who kind of um, he gets the train on the mm-hmm. tracks. They then do kind of end up taking some of their own initiative and splitting with him eventually, and coming to really resent yeah. him. And so it's this kind of interesting thing where Raymond and Mortimer preside over Purdue when it achieves things that, you know, certainly financially, that the family has never achieved up to that point. But I do feel as though they're kind of carrying out a, you know, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a game plan that he devised yeah. that they then are, are sort of supersizing. 
So Valium plays a big role in building up their fortune. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that all came to be? Yeah. So, you, you know, you have this interesting moment early on with the brothers where they are, um, they're at this asylum, Creedmoor in Queens. They see thousands of patients who are suffering from different psychiatric disorders. And they, they kind of have this, what I think of as a sort of a fairly idealistic, notion that, you know, wouldn't it be great if someday there was just a pill for this stuff? If these are chemical imbalances in the brain, then maybe there are chemical solutions. And they don't come up with it, but somebody comes up with Thorazine, another drug company comes up with Thorazine, which is this um, uh, a major tranquilizer for psychotic patients. And eventually the asylums all empty out because there are all these people who can now be treated on an outpatient basis because they're administered with Thorazine. But one of the kind of patterns that repeats itself in this story is that you have a kind of a nuclear problem. You have a big problem that afflicts some subsection of the mm. population and you devise a nuclear solution <laughs> to combat that problem. But then in terms of the kind of profit motive of the businesses, they'll then say, well, what if there's some sort of downgraded version of that affliction? It's not quite that you're psychotic. And could we find something that we could actually market on a much wider basis um, as a cure. So you have the major tranquilizer Thorazine, you then get these minor tranquilizers, Librium and then Valium, Miltown is another mm -hmm. famous one. And the idea there is it's not for, you know, people who are suffering from psychosis and in, a, in a, an insane asylum, it's for anybody, anybody who's a little stressed, anybody who's got, who's got a little anxiety. And in, in short order, the first drug Librium becomes the best selling drug in the history of the pharmaceutical business. And a few years later, Roche, the same company, rolls out Valium, which takes first place. But Librium kind of stays in the top five for years. And the person who designed all the marketing for both of those drugs and actually had a, a compensation system in which he would be paid an escalating series of bonuses based on literally the number of pills they sold was Arthur Sackler. Wow. You know, a, a lot of this uh, still plays out today, this idea of you, uh, you know, getting an FDA approval for one indication. And then, of course, once it's approved, then doctors can write it for uh, whatever they choose, you know, these off-label uses. And then opening up your uh, uh, marketing for other things is very, very common, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the whole role of the FDA in this story. Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> and, and believe me, you know, for me, it was an interesting thing to publish the book in April and at the point where it came out, I had had my first Pfizer shot. <laughs> and, you know, early in the book, right. I talk about mm -hmm. how in the 1950s, Pfizer bribed the FDA. Right. I mean, they, you know, they had this kind of complicated scheme involving Arthur Sackler in which they were paying a huge amount of money to the guy who was the head of antibiotics at the FDA. I, I would argue that the kind of um, the systemic failures of the FDA that you see back then and that you see around the rollout of OxyContin mm -hmm. Uh, in some ways are still with us today. And yet at the same time, I also think everybody should go out and get their shots. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> It is it is interesting how often the FDA comes up in your book, uh, this, you know, pulling the curtain back and, and seeing this kind of inappropriate relationship that seemed to play out between the stacklers and the people at the FDA who are in charge of regulating their drugs. Yeah. And I think, you know, to me, one of the more shocking stories in the whole book is about this guy, Curtis Wright, who was the chief FDA official in charge of uh, approving OxyContin for sale to U.S. consumers, but also approving the marketing language that could be used um, kind of in the, in the package insert. And uh, this guy, Curtis Wright, signs off on OxyContin and then you know, leaves the FDA. And a year later, he's working mm -hmm. at Purdue for three times his government salary. And you know, what was more alarming, this is a thing that's, it's in the book, but I kind of buried it in the, in the end notes. Um, I filed a FOIA request with the FDA, which they kind of slow rolled. And so I sued them oh. to, to compel them to turn over stuff to me under FOIA. And I got a New York federal judge to, to order them to turn over thousands and thousands of pages of documents, which they did. But in that process, one of the main things I wanted to see was I wanted to see Curtis Wright's yeah. emails and his communications. And, uh, and FDA came back to me. This is just, you know, a, a year yeah. or two ago. They came back and said um, they couldn't provide me with any Curtis Wright documents because they had all either been lost or destroyed. Wow. 
There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned Oxycontin. So let's let's go ahead uh, and jump further into the book. This is the the part that really uh, piques a lot of people's interest. You know, it, it seemingly came out of nowhere, but this concept of trying to find something to take the place of the morphine drip. Coming out of the gate there, you had this different idea in mind, right? Yeah. I mean, it starts, so Purdue, you know, to kind of pick up where we, where we left off with the brothers, it, Purdue Frederick is this company that Arthur buys for the brothers in, in 1952. And for decades, it's a, it's a very profitable company, but doing pretty uninteresting, unglamorous stuff. They basically were licensing a lot of primarily over-the-counter remedies. But in the 70s and 80s, they start getting into the treatment of pain. And as they're doing this, there's the beginnings of a, a kind of movement to reassess the ways in which physicians, certainly in the UK and the US and North America, uh, treat pain and a sense that we don't treat it aggressively enough. And so the first drug prior to OxyContin was this drug called MS Contin, which was a, a morphine pill, basically, with a coating, the, the content part. Um, is short for continuous. And so the idea is it was, it's a, a morphine pill where you would take it and then slowly over the course of hours, it filters into your bloodstream. And that was a real game changer for cancer patients because it meant that they could be treated with morphine um, and sleep through the night, not necessarily have to be in the hospital to be administered their, their pain medication. And it was a big success. And another thing that I think that I, I guess I had known, but not really fully appreciated until I researched this book is the extent to which for any pharma company, it's really all about the, the patent. So right. Oxycontin is really born at the point where the exclusive patent for MS content is running out. The patent cliff. Right. The patent <laughs> cliff, yeah, is the term which I, which I thought was yes. really vivid. <laughs> yeah. And so they devised this drug Oxycontin, which is the same principle, which is another opioid. So derived from the opium poppy, but actually more powerful than morphine. And it's this interesting thing. So it's, it's a more powerful remedy, but they also had this conversation and it sort of harks back to what we were talking about with the, with the tranquilizers, where they say, you know, there's only so many cancer patients. We really want to do this as a cancer drug. What if we found a way to market this for anybody who is suffering, not just from severe pain, but even moderate pain, that much bigger market of tens of millions of people, that's what we want to go after. And I think they basically do it by kind of hoodwinking the medical establishment into thinking that this drug is going to be kind of non-threatening and safe and have no side effects. They didn't seem to uh, address this misconception in the medical community that it was uh, less uh, addictive or right. All these things, just they just let spiral on. Part of what's so fascinating is it's all in black and white in the emails where they'll say, you get these senior executives at Purdue who will say, we've been doing focus groups. We found that doctors erroneously believe that our new product is weaker than our old product, the morphine product. Uh, and they say, let's not do anything to make them realize that they have it wrong. So it's a pharmaceutical company saying in black and white, physicians misunderstand fundamentally the product that we're selling them. Let's not disabuse them right. of that misunderstanding because it would be bad for uh, right. our market. The, the other thing I thought was interesting is you highlight this uh, move for AstroTurf uh, efforts to, you know, protect the this community of untreated pain patients out there that are suffering in silence. That, that seems to be a, this trend of uh, trying to get together to this alternative argument that we need to treat and reach out to, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing because, you, you know, you now have a community of people, many of them chronic pain patients who are worried that they're not going to have access to yeah. their opioids because they feel there's been an overcorrection. And, and my feeling about this community is that they were, you know, they were done poorly by on the way in and the way out. So I think they were very cynically used. There are people suffering with terrible pain. And, and historically, it was often the case that their pain was undertreated. But again, you have the emails, it's all there. There are these emails to Richard Sackler, where he's, he's, you know, talking with a doctor, uh, associate of his, and they talk about how it's important that we kind of align ourselves with this community of pain patients, but that it not look like it's the pharma company yes. driving things, that it look more organic. It looked like the, you know, the, the sort of patient's rights, uh, side of things. So, yeah, I mean, the, to me, the, um, the sophistication and the cynicism of 
this kind of PR campaign is, is really pretty staggering. You know, things seem to um, go in a, a different direction or at least accelerate when Richard took over, Richard Sackler. One of the businesses that Arthur, I believe it was Arthur, uh, started was IMS, right? This uh, company that was in, uh, looked at prescriber data, c- collected the data, and then other companies to this day. Including IMS. It became, it became a, a big multi-million dollar company. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There, I mean, everyone in the pharma world knows IMS, right? Uh, to target prescribers to our high prescribers, identify those who should have a little bit more, who maybe should be on speakers bureaus. Uh, IMS has become, uh, has been a player for, for a long, long time. Can you talk a little bit about how Purdue used prescriber data to uh, identify who these people were, how to target them, how to increase their uh, prescriptions over time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from a marketing point of view, you know, they ha- they had a huge sales force, an unusually big and unusually aggressive sales force, and a sales force that they incentivized in a distinctive way, where there was essentially no cap on the bonuses, and um, so they send these kind of shock troops out to make the case, but. Even there, you want to think about your resources and kind of, you know, who do you send them to? And, you know, at that time, it was going to target doctors who prescribe a lot of pills for pain. They wanted to target, I mean, interestingly, uh, general practitioners, people who weren't necessarily pain experts, people who, if, if a sales rep comes in and says, hey, doc, I got this great new thing. Most of what that doctor knows about the treatment of pain, they're learning from a sales representative, representative for the company who's there to sell them a drug. And the way in which they they did that was they used this data from IMS. It takes the authorities a little while to catch on that there's a problem with OxyContin. But of course, in retrospect, we know that Purdue knew the volumes of pills that were getting prescribed. So you have all these doctors who end up getting arrested and you know going to jail in some cases because if you look at their patient base and the size of their community and the demographics, and they're prescribing tendencies before. And then suddenly you see these huge spikes in OxyContin. They're just fire hosing these pills at the surrounding community. And there's no way to explain how like a little rural <laughs> osteopath could possibly be prescribing this much OxyContin. The company knew all that in real time. And there was this sort of head in the sand thing where what they would say in retrospect, when they were asked about it, they would say, oh, well, you know, we don't, it's not for us to make judgments about how a doctor doctor practices medicine. So to me, this is a very damning detail is the IMS data. There's a, uh, I believe you said there were 3000 prescribers on the speakers bureau for, for Purdue at one point and that a uh, hundred thousand prescribers targeted any of the numbers are astronomical for what really was a niche drug, right? Yeah. And the, I mean, this, the whole kind of junket side of it where the, yes, you have, I think it may have even been more than 3000 doctors who were kind of paid speakers who they would go out. And this, again, it goes back to Arthur Sackler, but he realized the way to persuade a doctor is to get another doctor to do the selling. And so you pay a doc to go out and give a speech. They would have these kind of all expenses paid junkets where it's like, do you want to come for a weekend of seminars on pain management at a, you know, at a golf resort in Scottsdale? I, yeah, I've, I've talked to doctors who say, oh, yeah, I know they do that, but I'm not personally influenced. But you could never influence yeah. me with a steak dinner. My, my, one of my favorite statistics in the book is that Purdue some years was spending $9 million a year just to buy food for doctors. And, and, and we know because we have the emails. Richard Sackler was a real stickler for the details. And, and you know, he was looking at the return on investment on each one of those dollars spent. And they knew that this was money well spent. I mean, they're, they're spending the money because it, it works. Yeah, this is 20 years later. Uh, last year, there was a large settlement involving Novartis involving, I mean, the, the allegations are, are nearly identical. Keep on going on and on involving blatant kickbacks uh, by different pharmaceutical companies. Um, so one of the things uh, that kind of plays out uh, in the book is that um, there's this focus on on Richard's point on numbers, everything's about numbers for him. Everything is about prescribing, getting the most out of the sales force. Um, and it, he seems to have this conflict with Kathy, his, I guess, his cousin. Uh, can you talk about that kind of relationship between the two of them? Candidly, part of what drew me to this story was that it was not just a story about big pharma and about the corruption of institutions, but also it was kind of a family saga. Richard, who was the uh, one of the sons of Raymond Sackler and Kathy, who was one of the daughters of Mortimer Sackler. So there are these two second generation Sacklers. They're both medical doctors. 
And they weren't the only ones who were involved as executives at the company, but you can tell that there was kind of a rivalry between them. And I, and I feel as though Richard ultimately really prevailed and became um, the dominant figure at the company and, and the one who was really mostly closely associated with OxyContin. It was his baby. He'll get, I mean, I, I can't even pull the number up off, off the top of my head, but he'll, he'll get these crazy sales figures, just astronomical sales figures. This is at a time when the drug is generating more than a billion dollars a year. And, he'll, yeah. you know, and he'll write back, bah, humbug, you know, he could do better. Um, so he had this um, uh, really, I think, pretty relentless drive to just do better and better. And this is a drug that ultimately, I think, over the years generated about $35 billion. Um, but it was never enough. We talked about how there really wasn't a whistleblower in this story, but there was an investigative journalist. Uh, in addition to yourself, uh, Barry Meyer uh, wrote something for the New York Times, and then the company tried to get him taken off the story, wrote a book, uh, which I have on my shelf that I'm reading next. Um, so certainly reporters played a big, a big role in exposing a lot of what was happening here, right? This whole story ends, sadly, in bankruptcy court, um, which, uh, you know, to me does not seem like a great place to resolve a, a mass tort uh, situation. But the judge in the case, um, who was kind of handpicked by Purdue, thought that a bankruptcy court was the ideal place in which to to resolve it. And he, in the final days when he was just finalizing the settlement, uh, just, uh, you know, whatever it was, 10 days ago, he took a lot of shots at mm -hmm. journalists. He really doesn't like the press at all. And it was funny because I, I honestly think that without journalists, uh, Purdue would not have been in bankruptcy court in the first place. You know, very little of, of the, what, what little accountability has been there uh, would have come to pass at all. It's people like Barry Meyer, who uh, in the New York Times and starting in 2001, so wow. starting 20 years ago, yeah. started writing these pieces and wrote a book called Painkiller, a great book. He was so threatening to Purdue and the Sacklers that their lawyer, their kind of hatchet man lawyer, went to the New York Times with this crazy argument where he said, because Barry had written a book about Purdue, he could never write about the company again because it would be a conflict of interest, um, which is pretty rich when Purdue accuses you of a conflict of interest. Right. But um, <laughs> the, the Times, which was at a kind of, in a moment of institutional vulnerability yeah. after the Jason Blair scandal, went along with it and and took the guy who you know who broke the story. Yeah. Off the story. Uh, the the other part of this story uh, that I find fascinating because I, I know some of these people personally um, is in Western District of Virginia in Roanoke and Abington. Uh, there were uh, some AUSAs, their assistant United States attorney at the time, Rick Mountcastle, and then John Brownlee, who decided that they'd seen enough in their community about uh, opioid uh, crisis breaking out there, and they decided to do something. Can you talk about the work that they did in moving a case forward against Purdue? So John Brownlee's appointed a uh, U.S. attorney in 2001, if I'm not mistaken, and he comes in. And at that point already, the Western District of Virginia, OxyContin had really just been causing all kinds of problems. And there was a Rick Mountcastle and Remy Ramsayer, another, another AUSA there, had been putting, they've been trying to put together a case against Purdue. And they end up spending five years doing this incredible investigation you know, they're working out of a, kind of a strip mall office in Abingdon. You know, they subpoenaed millions of documents. Uh, they did a huge amount of grand jury testimony. I mean, it was a really incredible investigation. And eventually they, wanna, they want to charge three senior executives at Purdue with felonies. And uh, Rick Mountcastle has said, actually, that the, there was somebody else in my book who said it on uh, Not For Attribution, but then Rick Mountcastle has since said in congressional testimony that their real target was the Sacklers. What they wanted to do was flip these three senior executives, charge them with felonies, flip them, and then go after the people who own the company, which is the Sacklers. Uh, but what happened was that the Purdue ended up enlisting Mary Jo White and Rudy Giuliani, who prevailed upon the political leadership at the uh, Bush Justice Department to drop the felony charges so that these executives wouldn't be facing any jail time. And they did. And as a consequence, you got a guilty plea, a misdemeanor plea by the executives, a felony guilty plea by the company, $650 million fine, which was a speeding ticket when you look at the amount of money that OxyContin was generating. And the company went right back to it. I mean, they did not slow down one jot. And I, I mean, I, I can say that because I know it and I think I demonstrated it in the book, but 
if, if you're in any doubt, they <laughs> pled guilty again to criminal right. charges in point. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting. You know, when you talk about how Paul McNulty, the Justice Department, doesn't own this decision, either does Assistant uh, Attorney General Fisher. Or there's kind of this, uh, I don't know who decided this, but we decided not to prosecute them uh, or get felony convictions out of them at, at that time. Looking back on this in the um, 500,000 lives in some ways, some of them are pointy or certainly uh, could be attributed to some of the things that happened uh, because of Purdue. Um, what bothers you the most about what you uncovered. I mean, you know, it's funny the the it's not the Sacklers. Mm. It's all the systems. It's the systemic failure. Uh, I feel as though we have a, a series of institutions in place that are meant to protect consumers and are meant to uh, enforce the law and are meant to, you know, create some sense of justice and accountability both in terms of administering justice and in terms of creating a deterrent for future potential unscrupulous actors. And I just think you see failure kind of across the board. You know, the FDA fails, uh, the DEA fails, the Department of Justice fails, you know, Congress fails. I think the bankruptcy court failed. And you can go on and on. I mean, the, you know, the larger medical establishment did. And it, it's clear as day to me that, that part of the reason for that is, is just the sheer amount of money in play. But also, and again, I say this as somebody who, you know, passed the New York bar and, and thought about becoming a lawyer myself. And I'm married to a lawyer and many of my dearest friends are lawyers. That's my, that's my world. And um, I do think that a lot of it is about the willingness of um, people who should really know better to play handmaiden to companies and individuals who do appalling things. There's a quote that I, I use at the end of the book, you know, the, the saying that uh, everybody's entitled to a lawyer, but that doesn't mean it has to be you. You know, I think that's true with the lawyers. I think it's true with a lot of the former officials who ended up covering for Purdue and the Sacklers. Uh, I think it's true for the consulting firms like McKinsey. There's a line in the book where I, I quote an email from one McKinsey partner to another where there's more legal scrutiny on Purdue, which McKinsey has worked for all through this whole period, advising them on how to turbocharge their opioid sales. And one of the, one of the guys says to the other in an email, I think it's probably time we, we start destroying our emails. <laughs> from a compliance point of view, like never a thing that you want to see uh, um, one That's partner right. saying to another. So I think I, that to me was the most discouraging was was not so much the the moral bankruptcy of um, of the family or of the company, but the willingness of this the, these kind of larger rings of enablers to uh, to help them get away with it. Patrick, I, I really appreciate uh, you spending time with us today. We were only able to touch a little bit on the book. I highly recommend people read. I 100% agree with Patrick. The, the thing that jumped out at me is the system uh, is broken, or maybe it's fixed. It's fixed by those people that have the money to <laughs> to make it work to their billing. So um, I, I really appreciate you taking time with us uh, today on Fraud in America. Oh, it was so great to be with you. Thank you. If you believe you've witnessed fraud against the government at your job or want to learn more about these important laws to combat fraud, visit fraudinamerica.com. On our website, you can find whistleblower lawyers, blogs from these expert attorneys, and more. You can also find a transcript of today's show, show notes, a way to contact our team, and a way to chip in to make sure we can keep bringing you the latest on fraud. This episode was edited and produced by Rachel Brooks, and our theme music is by Connor Chaos. A big thanks to our staff and researchers of Jeb White, James King, Emma Bass, Jackie DeMar, Kate Scanlon, Brian Markovitz, and Max Boltman. You can learn more about them at fraudinamerica.com slash team. Fraud in America is a project of Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund.